The Cincinnati Reds' biggest weakness so far this season was their biggest strength in Monday night's win. Lock Cincinnati Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and my co-host, Stephen Offenbaker, is off today. He'll be back uh, on tomorrow's episode, but I am a lifelong Cincinnati Reds fan that has turned an addiction to this team into information for you. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to me talk some Reds with you. I encourage you, if you're listening, hit me up on Twitter or check me out on YouTube here on the Lockdown Reds YouTube page and drop a thought in our comments section. Talking Reds is what I do, and I want to talk Reds with you. Lockdown Reds is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. We are your team every day. And if you listen every day, let us know you're an every day or down in the comments section. But when it comes to today's podcast, we have a lot to talk about. The Cincinnati Reds got a big win against the Tampa Bay Rays on Monday night. They won eight to one. And in a game where they win eight to one, you probably figure the biggest story is the lineup. No. It's the bullpen and what the bullpen had to do. They really had to kind of scramble a little bit. We'll talk about exactly why they had to scramble because it was due to an injury scare. Thankfully, we got some good news on that, and I'll tell you more about that later on in the show when it comes to Hunter Green. There's also some good injury news where it comes to another Reds pitcher, and there's a concerning stat that is out there when it comes to Reds Fielding. Before we get to all of that, I wanted to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by HelloFresh. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Go to HelloFresh.com slash MLB60 and use code MLB60 for 60% off plus free shipping. All right, I want to start with the bullpen here today because the bullpen passed a huge test on Monday, and Alexis Diaz never came into the game. We're talking about a game in which the Reds didn't have their best guy out on the mound from the bullpen, and they pitched magnificently. They they gave up one run. There there was a home run that was hit off of Kevin Hergett, but it was in garbage time. The Reds were way ahead, and it was a solo shot. It was, for all intents and purposes, the Reds' bullpen did exactly what they had to do. And it's not flashy. We're not going to talk about, you know, huge strikeout numbers. People who went to the ballpark last night on Monday night did not get free pizza. There were only five strikeouts in the game. But the Reds were efficient with their pitching. And it, it all stemmed from the fact that the bullpen had to be used so early because of an injury to Hunter Green. And now the uh, what happened was there was a line drive that was off his left shin, so that's his plant foot when he's pitching. Uh, he was able to finish the third inning because this happened in the third inning, but whenever he came out, um, and, and we'll see a clip of him later where he talks about this, like when he was in the dugout, it really started to get sore, and so he decided that, yeah, that was it for him. But that was 18 outs that the bullpen had to get. They had to get 18 outs on Sunday, and I think they had to get 18 outs last Friday. It was either last Friday or last Thursday. But regardless, we're talking about a very taxed bullpen, and there were three guys, four guys, sorry, four guys that just had amazing performances, and it starts with Buck Farmer, who basically didn't warm up at all before coming in to replace Hunter Green. He had to come in in the quick because David Bell realized, okay, this isn't going to work. Hunter Green's not feeling well. We're not going to throw him out there on one leg. Uh, we got to get somebody out here. And Buck Farmer came in on the shortest of possible notices. Uh, it's, it's like whenever you play MLB The Show and you just, for kicks, you're just like, let's just bring a, bull, a pitcher in and out of the bullpen. They usually kind of stink for the first couple of pitches. But kudos to Buck Farmer. As he pitched, he got four outs for the Reds uh, there whenever, you know, not warming up at all. He did have a couple of walks, but all in all, it was a very nice performance from him. And then after him came in Alex Young, who is continuing to show me. I, I, I'm wondering, and we, we've talked about our concerns about Revar San Martin and his performances so far this season. 
is Alex Young becoming the actual number one left-hander instead of the number two left-hander in this bullpen. Could be something me and, and Steve talk about on a later episode. But all in all, a great performance for him. He got four outs. He got a huge double play, kind of a lucky double play because it was a soft line drive that went right at Will Myers, and he was able to catch, um, I believe it was Harold Ramirez off second base. Ramirez stumbled trying to get back to the base, and so they were able to double him up, get out of that inning because there were runners on first and second with one out, and then all of a sudden, boom, innings over. The, 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 that was the Rays' second best chance at runs on the night. And Ian Jabot saw the Rays' best chance because in the sixth inning, they had <coughs> excuse me, they had runners in scoring position with two outs, and he threw a pitch that was really in a good spot and let up this pop fly that was in no man's land in shallow right field. It's the kind of hit that usually falls for – uh, for some kind of hit, some kind of RBI here. So the fact that Jake Fraley, and, and you may have seen the highlight if you haven't, go look it up, but Jake Fraley runs in, full extension, dives, maybe doesn't take the best route to get to the ball, but all in all was able to make an amazing play that saved probably multiple runs. Because if he doesn't make that catch, it bounces, it rolls. You're probably talking about two runs for the Rays. And at that point, it would have been like a 4-2 game. So we would have been talking about a ball game. But instead, it kept the scoreboard clean. And the lineup just continued to play add-on from there. We'll talk about them here in just a minute. But then Ian Jabot proceeded to pitch a brilliant seventh inning after, you know, a couple of very stressful innings in the fifth and the sixth, he comes out and pitches one, two, three in super efficient style. Was absolutely amazing to see. And and honestly, it was kind of a microcosm of the rest of the game. The Reds pitching was super efficient in this game. They only threw 138 pitches to get 27 outs. And I feel like there's been some games this year where it seems like starting pitchers threw 138 pitches to get out of the fifth inning. So that was great to see. And then, you know, also not to be outdone, Kevin Herget came in. This was after the Reds had blown the doors wide open on this game, absolutely increased their lead to the point that you felt comfortable. Like, it's it's always weird saying you feel comfortable with a lead in this bullpen. But I'm telling you, they really came out and, and they passed this test. This was a beautiful performance by a bullpen that is much maligned. And Kevin Herget was able to finish it off two innings. Uh, he did give up the one home run, but he actually recorded the most strikeouts by any one pitcher for the Reds in this game. And he had two. Again, not a flashy night for Reds pitching, but an efficient night. And look, at the end of the day, all we want the Reds pitching to do is to keep the scoreboard as clean as possible, and that's exactly what they did. So the rest of those stats, who cares? As long as that scoreboard says Reds more than the other team, that's all I care about, and that's exactly what happened. And, and also, uh, just a, a, a very efficient day for Reds pitching and for this bullpen that I, I think if you ask um, anybody that's keeping up any at all with the Reds, They'll tell you right now, yeah, the bullpen's terrible. But I think there's some underlying numbers, and it's something that me and Steve may dive into a little bit more that show that this bullpen is on the right track. And especially with the news that I've got coming up later on in the episode, it is definitely on the right track. But coming up next, we're going to discuss why the lineup was the catalyst to victory. That's coming up here in just a moment. Before we get to that, though, I want to tell you about our new sponsor, So Rare. I've been talking about them a couple of times now. So Rare is a revolutionary fantasy baseball game in a marketplace that transforms fans into owners with officially licensed digital cards featuring players from across all 30 MLB teams. If you go there today, you go to SoRare.com slash locked on, and you're going to uh, be able to draft your team, put together your lineup, and start competing in free events. And then you build your lineup with increasingly better players, increasing increasing more rare players that help you win bigger prizes because you can win awesome prizes with this. We're talking about tickets to MLB games, VIP experiences where you can meet players, you can get jerseys, you can get all kinds of great stuff. It's all at so rare. Dot com. It's a revolutionary fantasy game. You got to check it out today. And that's so rare.com slash locked on. Again, S O R A R E dot com to draft your team of free player cards. You then set your lineup and start competing 
to win epic rewards. So rare.com slash locked on to start playing today. The Reds play the Rays tonight at 6.40 p.m. Eastern Time. Nick Lodolo is going to go up against the Rays' Taj Bradley. The Rays have an interesting pitching situation as well, and uh, the Reds are uniquely positioned to take advantage of it. Looking forward to seeing how they can tonight. You can catch every pitch of the Reds' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Search Reds. And thanks, as always, for making Lockdown Reds your first listen every day. Every day or tomorrow on the show, we're going to break down how Nick Lodolo does against that dangerous Rays lineup. But the Reds continue to have their own dangerous lineup last night. In fact, it was something we talked a little bit about with Connor Thomas from Lockdown Phillies breaking down that series and, and kind of breaking down how the Reds were able to take advantage of a Phillies pitching staff that's kind of hurt right now. The Rays are too, and even though they went through a historic winning streak to begin the season, they suffered some interesting injuries that have really kind of put them behind the eight ball on their pitching staff, and we saw today they had an opener, and I thought David Bell actually kind of brilliantly set up his lineup to counter the Rays' opener strategy, but this lineup continues to grind out at bats and put the ball where the fielders aren't. It's not the kind of lineup that's going to just set the world on fire with home runs and lots of extra base hits. They're just going to be timely hits, putting them where they ain't. And, I mean, heck of a night for Kevin Newman. Breakout night for Newman. Multi-hit game. In fact, he was a triple shy of the cycle, and he got the scoring started with a home run. But I thought it was interesting because, you know, he was part of this brilliant line of construction because the guy who began the game for uh, the Rays, Jalen Beeks, was a lefty. And so, you know, David Bell loves to load up the righties, but David Bell didn't put an all right-handed lineup together because he didn't want to have to shuffle and do all this other stuff later in the game. He put Jake Fraley toward the bottom of the lineup. He put TJ Friedel in the ninth spot. TJ Friedel had a big game in this. But the reason he did that is because he knew Jalen Beeks wasn't going to be there for very long. And he was correct. I mean, Jalen Beeks only threw 47 pitches in this game. The guy who relieved him, um, or the guy who finished out the game for the Rays, excuse me, not not Kelly, but uh, Chisler, uh, he was able to um, pitch. Uh, he threw the bulk of the pitches for the Rays. But overall, the way that the Rays did this, whereas they started with a opener of a left-handed pitcher for like, you know, a minute, and David Bell was like, okay, top of the lineup, righties. Bottom of the lineup, lefties. And it worked to perfection because the bottom of the lineup just absolutely did damage to this uh, Rays pitching staff. And I thought it was telling because in his post-game interview, they were talking to Kevin Newman about, you know, his performance and things like that. And they were they asked him about, you know, what, what do you take away from this performance uh, that the Rays were able or the Reds were able to beat the Rays after Hunter Green goes out so early? And I thought his response was interesting. Yeah, no, it's huge for us. Um, you know, we're in every single game. Um, and so, you know, to come out and play that team the way we did tonight, especially with Hunter going down and seeing the way that the team, um, you know, lift each other up is huge for us. I think that, um, you know, we've known who we are and how we compete. Um, and I think that uh, I think that people are really starting to see that, um, you know, it's not going to it's not going to go down without a fight, um, you know, and, and we're willing to do that. Does that sound familiar? Because it should. Most Reds players that uh, we've heard after games and stuff like that continue to say, we're going to grind it out. We're going to fight it out. This team never gives up. This team is always in the game. All this other stuff. And we've seen it. There's been one game. Obviously, it was Sunday's game. And even then, they still scored a couple of runs on the Phillies. But there's been one game where you say, all right, the, the lineup just was completely out of it. And that's only because Luis Sessa had a historic blow up for his start. But the Reds have been in every game because of the way this lineup goes. And I mentioned T.J. Friedel. He had four RBIs. He had a bases-clearing double, which really got the, it blew the game open. The Reds were up one nothing in the fourth inning. And this was after, you know, they, they just uh, had Buck Farmer pitch uh, in the top half of the fourth because Hunter Green was unable to go. So you're kind of wondering, uh, what's going to happen here? And the Reds had the bases loaded. And T.J. Friedel at the plate, the number nine hitter. 
which in any lineup, you're looking at the number nine hitter and you're like, ah, base is loaded. Okay. Rays might get out of this. Out with TJ Friedel. He's still batting over 300 after an amazing day where he gets that bases clearing double that really put the Reds ahead and in the driver's seat to the point that you're like, okay, now we can really see what this bullpen's made of because a four run lead for most bullpens is almost, I'm not going to say it's completely insurmountable, especially against a team like the Rays, who has shown the ability to come back from multiple deficits of worse than four runs. Uh, but you feel a little bit more comfortable with them. And it's very obvious with the Reds bullpen, you're just like, yeah, maybe not. Maybe not so comfortable with a four run lead. Now, they did play add-on, continue to go in. I mean, Jose Barrero had an RBI double later in the game. And it was interesting because it was ruled a double, but he ended up on third because he advanced to third on the throw, and he used a brilliant slide to get into third base because if you watch it, the third baseman for the Rays, he gets the throw from uh, the catcher because they tried to get uh, – and, and I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on who was on. I think it was Jake Fraley was on base. Um, they tried to get Jake Fraley at the plate – it was way late, wasn't, wasn't even close. So then the catcher tries to get Barrero at third, and Isak Paredes, the Rays' third baseman, puts the tag down, and Jose Barrero does one of those things where he's sliding in head first, and he reaches around the tag and hits third base. I mean, you watch the replay. Paredes' glove was nowhere near Jose Barrero. Those are the kind of plays, and... I'm not saying I'm comparing him here, but those are the kind of plays that like Mookie Betts makes and Ronald Acuna. And Jose Barrero is just like, yeah, I can do that too. L love to see that play from Jose Barrero. There's, there's just glimpses. There's little glimpses. I feel like in every game that you're like, man, feels like Barrero could really figure this thing out. And there's also glimpses that he's still got a lot to work on. He, he got beat really badly by a couple of sweepers. That's what everybody's calling sliders that just break crazy horizontally. I think I heard a breakdown in the Red Sox angels games that a slider is somewhere between nine and 12 inches of uh, horizontal break. And then a sweeper is greater than 13 inches of horizontal break. Cool. That's that, that, that great. Whatever they, they all confound Jose Barrero still, I mean, he's, he can lay off one, but it's like the pitcher knows, okay, he laid off that one. He's not laying off the next one, and he's usually right. But I still see glimpses of Jose Barrero every now and then that make me think, man, if he could just get every, if he could pull it all together, it would be really interesting. But I, I, I mentioned in, you know, talking about how good the bullpen was for the Reds and how efit, efficient they were. Red's hitters actually kind of forced the Rays to throw an entire extra innings worth of pitches compared to how many pitches the Reds threw, which I thought, you know, that's kind of a weird number. Yeah, let me connect the dots real quick. So the Reds, the Reds threw 138 pitches. The Rays threw 155 pitches. So still, you know, 17 pitches is a pretty efficient inning overall, but that's an entire another innings worth of labor that the Reds put on Ray's pitching. And it just goes to show that the grittiness, the grindiness of a Reds at bat on any pitching staff is taxing. And they're really good at doing it because this lineup just continues to put the ball where fielders aren't. It's something that the Cleveland guardians did to play off effectiveness last year. It's been pretty helpful for the Reds so far. You know, Hunter Green got some good news after leaving the game early. There was another Reds pitcher who got some good injury news, and there's this concerning stat regarding Reds fielding. So, yeah, a little bit of a roller coaster segment coming up uh, right after this. And, and this is the fact that, you know, the Reds and the Rays are playing tonight at 6.40 p.m. Eastern time. The Reds will see if they can make it six straight wins over the Rays at Great American Ballpark. That's right. Five straight wins over the Tampa Bay Rays at Great American Ballpark. Uh, and you can catch every pitch of the Reds' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Simply search Reds. You can also follow uh, me uh, on Twitter. You can follow me at Jeff Carr with three Fs. You can follow Steve on Twitter as well at S. Offenbaker with two Fs. And you can follow the show at Locked On Reds. Make sure that you check us out on YouTube 
as well. Would love for you to jump in the comments section, give us a question, give us a comment, whatever you've got, uh, and let us know if you're an everydayer as well. All right, uh, Hunter Green did leave after three innings of uh, pitching, taking a line drive off of the leg that he plants. So obviously he pushes off with his right, he plants with his left. That's the one where he took the line drive off the shin. And he he felt fine, he said. He's like, I felt good enough to pitch the rest of that inning. But it was clear after he came into the dugout that he was not going back out to pitch. I really wanted to finish that inning. I knew I could finish it. Um, but, yeah, as soon as I, like, came in and kind of stood and wasn't really moving and activating it, it tightened up right away. And um, It would be foolish to go back out there. I mean, I really wanted to just to go out there and – uh, be able to compete for the team, but I would be using nothing but arm and just it's too early in the season and just wouldn't make sense. Yeah, I, I I don't necessarily want to make a claim one way or the other. It's not a situation where I'm, I want to make a prediction and be right or wrong about it. I hope he makes his next start because obviously any amount of time that one of Hunter Green, Nicola Dola, or Graham Ashcraft misses, that's going to be detrimental to this team. But I also want them to be very careful with them because, you know, we know what happens with uh, these different contusions and things like that. Like, we don't want it to become a bigger thing. We want it to remain small cookie. So if he just misses one start, they got to skip one start. I think that's going to be okay. However, David Bell wasn't talking about that. He wasn't really alluding to that being their plan uh, moving forward. Well, it, it's it's not uh, fractured or anything like that, but um, those those type of contusions yet yet to be um, on top of it because they can turn into um, a bigger issue. So um, I know our training staff has been on top of it, and as of right now, you know the, the goal is to have him make the next start. Now, allow me to uh, insert the disclaimer here that David Bell is always super optimistic with any medical take on any player. So just take that all with a grain of salt. But it sounds like Hunter Green avoided anything serious and he might miss one start. I think I, I think at this point I'd be safe in saying he probably doesn't make his next start, which is a little bit of a bummer. It would be against Pittsburgh. But if there is a team that you could get by with throwing a guy that's not necessarily, you know, a, a, one of your best three starters, it's probably Pittsburgh. Although they have been playing well here recently, so maybe that's totally wrong. Uh, but I, I'll tell you this, who else got a very, very good uh, update? In fact, it, he was with the team on Monday, and that's Lucas Sims. He was able to pitch back-to-back -back days, Saturday and Sunday, for Louisville, and he is back with the team. He is expected to return and be and, and uh, you know be taken off the injured list and rejoin the team for playing on Wednesday. Now, I'm not sure what the point is of bringing him up. Maybe that's just like, hey, he's not going to pitch for these next two games in Louisville, so let's just bring him back with the team. He can be back with his teammates, and then he'll be pitching on Wednesday. But the good news is we know when he's going to be back, and Lucas Sims will return and, and, and be at the top of that bullpen with Alexis Diaz. That is super good to hear, especially if we're going to start seeing some bullpen guys figure it out. I mean, you know, I talked about Alex Young. I think that he has shown himself to at least be in a conversation with, is he the best left-handed pitcher in the bullpen, as opposed to Revar San Martin, who we came into this year thinking, um, what what are we going to get out of Kevin Hergett? We saw one outing from Casey Legamina. Really want to see some more from him. I'm hoping that it's not a case where Lucas Sims gets activated and they immediately send Casey Legamina down. I think this will be something that Steve and I talk about tomorrow is, all right, Lucas Sims is back. Who gets sent down? Because it feels like there are multiple guys in this bullpen that I do want to see more out of. And there's some guys in this bullpen that I'm kind of done with. But it, it's all going to, you know, the option game is going to come into play. How the Reds manage their roster from this. It, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how that happens. But the good news is the bullpen is getting better because Lucas Sims is returning. Okay, so that, that was the fun stuff. That was the good stuff. Now let's talk about something not so good because... It was something that I noticed last night. And, you know, Jake Fraley's play notwithstanding, there were a couple of plays that I felt like the Reds could have done a little bit better with. 
and they didn't really bite them in the butt. Seems like usually when they make these errors or when they make these defensive plays that maybe don't go down as an error, but you look at that and you say, well, that should have been an out. Uh, it, it seems to really bite them in the butt. It didn't last night. However, Sports Information Solutions, these are the guys that really kind of got Moneyball going in the early 2000s and, and really kind of got analytics going, uh, have a ranking. And they, they tweeted out their rankings last night when it comes to defensive statistics. And it's interesting because the Reds are dead last in one of them and second to last in the other one. And it's they're dead last in turning grounders or bunts into outs. And literally, this isn't like... You know, there's not a caveat of this. Like, well, these are balls that they should have gotten to, or these are balls that they didn't have that much of a chance to. This is literally every single ground ball and every single bunt that they field. What percentage of those plays are they turning into outs? And they're dead last, which means it's less than 70% of the ground balls that they get. They're turning into outs. That's concerning especially when you talk about you want to have a pitching staff at Great American Ballpark that gives up ground balls and not fly balls. Because you give up fly balls, usually Great American, they turn into homers. You want to keep them on the ground, but if your defense isn't turning those into outs, then yeah. And that was something that I tweeted at the time. It's like, you know, the bullpen has been maligned, and, and for good reason. They, they haven't performed up to snuff just yet, and, and they've cost the Reds multiple games. But it feels like the bullpen's taken the brunt of that when we kind of look at this defense and they have not done any favors to the bullpen or the starters. They, they should be better than they've been playing. And it's it was a focus in spring training. It was a focus coming into the season. And we haven't seen an improvement. In fact, according to this, you might even say you've seen them take a step back. So dead last in turning grounders and bunts into outs. And the Reds are second to last in turning fly balls and line drives to the outfield into outs. So the infield isn't fielding ground balls. The outfield isn't fielding line drives or fly balls. Yeah, that's not good, <laughs> right? Like, that that's kind of all of the hits. That's, that's all of the ways that a ball can go somewhere, right? Like, I mean, I, they, they didn't tweet out, their statistic is, you know, sports information solutions didn't tweet out the, uh, you know, fly balls and line drives to infielders stat, but I'm guessing that's not great either. But when it comes to how the Reds are turning balls into play into outs, it's not great. And as we move forward throughout the season, if we're constantly talking about, well, you know, the Reds pitching staff might not look that great for this statistic, but if you look at their batting average on balls in play, I think that's going to get pretty old pretty quick because at the end of the day, they just got to make outs. And, and and there's certain guys and people say, well, you know, I want to move Jonathan India to left field or, you know, I want to move uh, this guy here or, you know, all this other stuff. I don't know if that fixes that. I just, I'm, I'm not necessarily sure. I feel like the Reds have some guys coming up who have good gloves and maybe that helps in a couple of different spots. And Jose Barrera has been very strangely inconsistent. Feels like every so often he makes a really good play and he makes a really bonehead play back to back at shortstop. And, and you want that consistency. And he he was billed as an elite defender and we were worried about his bat. But his defense has not really shown through to be elite. At least not on a consistent basis. And, and because of that, you have a very average to below average fielder in Jonathan India. So up the middle, you have lots of inconsistency. The Reds and Nick Crawl have tried to build this roster from the middle out. We got to see how that really takes to fruition on the fielding side, because right now the Reds have a lot of room to go. I mean, you can look at it this way. They got nowhere to go, but up because they're, they're at the bottom, but hopefully that uh, improves like we saw what the bullpen did on Monday. And that's how we're going to end today's episode. But before we get out of here, don't forget that the Reds and Rays play tonight at 6.40 p.m. Eastern time. You know, Will Myers is still looking for career home run number one against the team that he made his major league debut against. He's only played seven games against the Rays in his entire career. 
It's kind of amazing to think about. But you can catch every pitch of the Reds hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Reds. But that's going to wrap us up for this edition of Locked on Reds. Uh, Reds, thanks as always for making us your first listen every day. Every day or tomorrow on the show. Steve will be back, and we will break down Nick Lodolo's start against the Dangerous Rays lineup. Now for your second listen, check out Locked On Fantasy Baseball. You can win your league by listening to Matt and Dom every day as they bring you the best fantasy sports analysis that you can find. That's Locked On Fantasy Baseball, just like Locked On Reds. It's free and available on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. And we're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And as we move through these next couple of days with the Rays, Steve will be back tomorrow to break it down. We're going to have a crossover on Thursday with the Rays guys to break down this series because we're going to be locked on Reds every single day.